Hello and welcome to the Counterweight Podcast, where we talk about how we can strive for a world in which freedom and reason are at the forefront of all human society. In this week's podcast, we'll be talking about activism as a heroic quest for symbolic immortality, terror management, the COVID-19 pandemic, and how and why critical social justice and woke activism absolutely exploded during that period. Okay. Um, so last time we talked about groupthink and how that as a concept has been defined fairly kind of ambiguously, um, that people have looked at cancel culture and they've said, this is a clear example of groupthink, but they haven't really really gone into the academic literature and see if it corresponds. We did that last time and we found that while there are some problems, it doesn't fit neatly. Um, it does seem to be quite a useful paradigm, if you like, um, to look at the phenomenon of cancel culture. Um, so today's in today's podcast, we're going to look at a another couple of concepts, one of which arises from philosophy. Uh, and another one which is linked, which arises from psychology. Um, the first being existentialism. Um, so it's this this fear of existence, the fear of ending of existence, the, the, the meaning of existence, what it means to exist, um, which is comes up in themes explored by philosophers such as Kierkegaard, famously Nietzsche. Nietzsche is certainly my favorite one. Um, and we're also going to look at terror management. So this idea of when confronted with an existential threat, so a threat to your existence, a threat to your life, um, how do you cope with that? How, how do you cope with, for example, the certainty of death? You know, death is a, uh, is a certainty, of course, but we don't really think of it as a certainty most of the time. Most of the time we're trying to put that fear off. Uh, and then certain, at certain times, we can't put it off at certain times we're confronted with it. And we think that this links really interestingly with the COVID outbreak, because during the COVID outbreak, suddenly we were presented with an existential threat. And there were many commentators who were suggesting, you know, look, here we are, here is this big threat. Um, it's going to unite people, these kind of the, the, the superficial offense archeology span and seeking that seems to be happening. Well, that's going to die away because that's that's minor. You know, nobody's dying from these things, whereas COVID might actually kill you. So, you know, it seemed to make sense that this would go away or, or at least simmer down in face of a, a real threat, which was COVID and with people actually dying. But but the opposite seemed to happen. Um, instead, what was already really bad seemed to go on steroids. Um, it was really, really dialed up. So the opposite of what seemed to be common sense happened. So we're going to look into philosophy and psychology to try and explain what was going on there. Um, and we have an article, um, an article. Yeah, it predates COVID, which is kind of good in a way because it's not framed. Um, but we find it really, really useful um, to explain some of the, the phenomenon that was happening. Um, so would you like to introduce it? I would. It, so this is an article from 2016 from the Journal of Social and Political Psychology, and we'll post uh, information in the uh, show notes. Um, and uh, it's called, serendipitously, Activism <laughs> as a Heroic Quest for Symbolic Immortality, an Existential Perspective on Collective Action. And uh, I'm going to just read the abstract real quick because that way everyone will have this broad overview and then we can kind of um, work, work our way through. So um, excellent research exists on the conditions that generate political and social activism. Yet a central issue has remained perplexing. How does the personal need to stand out as unique and heroic interact with the concern for the positive image of the group and the desire to protect and bolster its status, goals, and shared values. In propelling collective action inspired by uh, existential theory and research, this paper proposes an existential perspective on activism that identifies the human desire for a sense of meaning and significance as an important motivation underlying individual's choice to engage in collective action. The study outlines, it says it's a study, it's really 
not a study. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a theory. Uh, mm-hmm. so I'll, I'll, the, the study outlines an integrative model of collective action, combining insights from existential psychology with insights, uh, from the social identity perspective to bridge together needs and concerns associated with both personal identity and group identity into a single model of collective action through the concept of death anxiety buffering mechanisms. This model suggests that collective action is an effective means to satisfy existential needs through bolstering and protecting group interests and values on the one hand and react and realizing the activist heroism on the other. Okay. So there's quite a lot to unpack there. Um, we have two seemingly contradictory theories that kind of arise from that. And I, I, I get that the paper reconciles them, but we might want to kind of introduce them um, to begin with. So for example, we've got this idea of, um, it's often called virtue signaling, isn't it? Like, like, why is it that, that people engage in activism? Like one of the observations I've made, for example, why is it that people seem to be, um, even academics extremely passionately in favor of critical social justice? without actually having read the literature and you know you know that when you're talking to them okay give me an example give me an example and they just can't do it because they haven't read it so so why is it that they're doing that on an individual level um and and, and lots of people would just say well it's look it's just virtue signaling it's just, just look at me and look how moral how superior i am to to everyone else around me and then there seems to be the other thing um which is this commitment to group you know, that I'm simply going along with the fashions of the group, right? Um, what do you think it, the tension is between those two perspectives? Yeah, so the article does suggest that they, I mean, it actually calls them, um, you know, some like twin uh, ontological, you know, motives or something like that. But um, I, uh, I see this, as maybe less in conflict. And I think that the, you know, as the, as the author moves along, um, she, she, uh, has less, less, less difficulty with them also. But yeah, I, I think that, um, in order to, we actually alluded to this a couple of weeks ago when we did the group think there's this need to stand out within the group also. So there, we talked about risky shift, right? How people will, um, uh, want, they want to be more of whatever is valued in the group. And although, um, that's not described here, that is sort of what they're alluding to with regard to heroism. So to become a hero, you can do more of what others are doing. So you, in that way, you stand out within the group and you get to, um, uh, to benefit from the group's accolades and the group's, uh, social, um, uh, standing or their social, um, their social, their work, their activism work. So you get to be more of an activism uh, or an activist, or you get to be, you know, stand out as a special one in some way. So I don't know. I don't have, I mean, what about you? Do you have, do you have trouble reconciling these? No, I don't. I, I was kind of surprised that the author had any trouble reconciling them at all. Although what she says is that Traditionally, they haven't been reconciled. Um, And and, and, I mean, I have to admit, I've not been in the literature for as long as she has. I mean, I've literally just picked this paper up and and read it. Um, But I I was surprised to see that they were they were they weren't reconciled before. Um, I mean, yeah, just going into that word ontology, because ontology is 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 a word where we lose people. Right. Um, It's seldom well defined. So simply speaking, ontology is the philosophy of existence. Um, so how do things exist? Do they exist and how, how do they exist? So like a classic ontological question I could ask you, um, would be, do ghosts exist? What do you think, Elizabeth? Do ghosts exist? Um, no. But they have to. So on some level they have to, right? So you could say, do ghosts exist as a spirit of a dead person? come back from the dead going and waking you up and rattling chains or throwing plates across the room, then you could say, okay, there's no physical evidence for that. 
so in all likelihood, it's reasonable to, to conclude that ghosts as supernatural entities do not exist. Um, however, on some level, they do exist because if you are, especially as a child, and I know I had this a lot, if you are, you wake up at night and for whatever reason, you know, it could be moisture in the floorboards or whatever, you hear the floorboards creaking or you think you hear footsteps. Um, now that might not be a ghost, probably is just moisture or a whole host of other perfectly normal mundane reasons why these things are happening. And you may even be aware of that at the time. And yet in your head, you're still worried about the ghost. And so the thought of the ghost exists and is causing anxiety and therefore consequence. Maybe your heart beats a little bit faster and therefore on some, at some level, the ghost exists, right? Not as a supernatural entity, but as a thought form that causes consequence. Um, and so that's, that it's those kinds of questions when we're talking about ontology. So how does it exist? So we're talking about really what are the conditions of existence of the person in the group? Um, and, and, and so I think, yeah, that this kind of idea that the person, the individual and the group are at odds to each other is um, quite silly. And I'm quite surprised that that had ever gained any traction at all within psychology. I mean, the, the example I'd like to use would be a professional football player or soccer, as you Americans call it. Well, actually, it could be either. Um, it could be football, American football, or it could yeah. be soccer. <laughs> Dochi demo, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So I'm slipping into Japanese. Dochi demo, me. It doesn't matter either or. Um, so, you know, you imagine you have this individual who has all of the skills in the world. They are objectively, in terms of physical fitness, um, in terms of their ability to play in goal, to play in every single position on the football field, they are objectively better than anybody who's ever lived. They are still not going to get into a any team, even a high school team, if they never pass the ball, right? If they never connect with their teammates, if they don't play as a team. Um, and so therefore, individual skill has to kind of nest itself within a framework. In that sense, the framework would be the, the high school football team or any football team. And so if you're a an individual who wants to present a set of a certain set of virtues, whatever virtues they are, they have to be nested within a context, be that um, a Christian group, an Islamic group, uh, a book circle. It, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, and, and so I'm surprised that they're presented at odds with each other. Yeah, I think that maybe, um, you know, as she describes, maybe in the literature, you know, and to use your sports analogy, you know, you, you might get like a, um, maybe in basketball, you might get a Michael Jordan or something who says, you know, basically, I'm going to I'm going to score 47 points today, you know, and that's what I'm, you know, and he, he does it right. And it does, really doesn't let anybody get in his, in his way. Um, um, and maybe, you know, is a real hot shot by, you know, telling people oh, I'm going to shoot from right there, you know, so that's where you're going to, you know, you go ahead and guard me. And so, so I think that, um, you know, maybe even in your sports analogy, you can get people that are, you know, uh, that, maybe are trading off some of um, sometimes in what they could accomplish on their own, like, as you say, by passing the ball, right? And so that may be valued very much by the group and, and by the audience, or it, it may not um, be what the, you know, the, uh, the star really wants. They might want a different kind of accolades. So, um, so maybe, I mean, you know, I, I'm with you. I, I don't really see that as necessarily so much in conflict. Um, I do have a different kind of um, sort of in terms of ontological sort of virtue based uh, kind of definition of uh, sort of, you know, decision making or choices. And that would be, um, you know, virtue based. What type of person am I? What type, and then virtue based in terms of the group, what type of group um, am I in? And so the, uh, the choice based, there is, you know, sort of, um, you know, again, this sort of virtue signaling, what kind of, what kind of group do I want to be in? What kind of uh, person do I want to be within that group? How do I want to be seen? Um, and so, uh, which still fits with the sports analogy, right? Do I want to be seen as the star or do I want to be seen as a really great supporting player? Um, and, you know, how do I, you know, manage that, uh, you know, within the group and 
when I'm on my own. Yeah, and, and another parallel we could do would be um, terrorism, for example. Um, so the vast majority, or let's think about Islamic terrorism, for example. When we, we look at polls of Islamic communities, we find quite a, because there are different Islamic communities, but we find quite a lot of sympathy um, towards the objective that some terrorists have. But out of the set of people who agree that they should commit a terrorist act, what percentage are actually going to go through and do the terrorism? It's always going to be quite small, right? Um, and, and, and so maybe that's a, a good parallel for the, the heroic quest for immortality, right? That um, a terrorist is committing an act that will explicitly end their lives because they think they're leaving, in the first sense, a moral legacy. But in the second, uh, they then have that, in, in their case, I mean, real immortality, right? It, it, it's real to them. They believe that they're going to have immortality in the hereafter, uh, in, in paradise. Um, and that is sort of where this article ends, mm. you know, in the in the uh, sort of terrorism. Um, but it, it's, you know, I mean, the, the, the bulk of the article is really about, um, you know, activism. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I sort of think about... Uh, you know, again, sort of the virtues inherent to the group and the virtues inherent to, you know, a single person's behavior. And, and um, you know, so and I, I think you had had mentioned, um, you know, sort of the Greeks. Right. You know, you're you're the right person um, or the right gr group um, for the job. You know, when you have the character traits uh, that permit you to do whatever it is well, um, you know, then, you know, that's then you are a hero in that, in that realm. So, you know, a doctor can be, you know, uh, you know, what's valued for doctors is sort of beneficence, right. And, and, and caretaking and that kind of stuff for judges, it would be more, you know, truth and, and justice. And so whatever, um, you know, if you're the right person for that, you know, job, that decision, that group, then, you know, you can rise sort of to, heroism based on the traits that that you have and i think this article is sort of suggesting that we choose our groups uh you know based on uh, you know a little bit on that sort of you know greek philosophy that you had mentioned mm -hmm. um, so um i don't know do we, so wh how does this uh we, i guess we should we should really before too much more time passes, we should really get down to what this author says, uh, how this relates to, um, to activism, right? Um, sure. you know, how is it that people, how does, how is that, uh, terror management theory? And then I should, I should, uh, I guess mention that, um, research that again, although this article is written in 2016, sort of one of the major, um, or several of the major, um, uh, social psychologist that researched terror management theory uh, did publish an article in 2020 um, that specifically linked um, COVID to um, terror management. Uh, and, you know, they say, you know, perhaps it was the, the, uh, the final tragic straw that broke the perver proverbial camel's back that occurred at a time when people had more time to engage in, um, you know, because of shutdowns and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it maybe intensified their reactions, fueled by a greater need for terror management, for death, uh, to manage the, the, their awareness of death. Many people jumped fervently into, want, into a cause. In this case, they're talking about um, racial justice causes in particular, um, as a way to feel that they were doing something of value with their lives. Uh, when in, the, you know, when in reality, the, the value of their, of our lives was in question, right? We were all, you know, in this limbo and not knowing, um, how long. So, um, terror management theory or, um, you know, death reminders, mortality salience. That's another word that's used in the literature. Um, uh, and, and in this article, uh, existential anxiety um, has been linked to lots of things related to cancel culture and um, 
and activism. Uh, reminders of death have been found to increase anxiety about violating norms. So people get concerned. They want to be affiliated with the group, with the right group. Okay. And they're concerned about, uh, they, they express anxiety about violating those group norms. Um, support for punishment for violating group norms. So uh, increased death awareness, support for punishing those who violate norms, aggression towards critics of beliefs. So worldviews, it enhances um, sort of attention to worldviews. And, um, and so critics of those worldviews then um, uh, are people endorse uh, aggression, conformity to standards, sensitivity to procedural injustice. Uh, willingness to engage in risky behavior. So that's where maybe we get the heroism, right? Yep. Um, hostility to threats against the worldview. Um, need for inclusion. So again, need, need to be included in the group and need for self distinction. So again, we have these, this like maybe this push and pull of wanting to stand out and also really a need to be in the group. And people have, um, uh, primed terror management or, or um, mortality salience in lots of sort of interesting ways. Um, they maybe ask people to fill out a survey uh, within sight of a funeral home, or they might ask people to um, describe what, what will happen to their body as they die and decay. So they might write a little a paragraph or something. So it might be, you know, very, um, you know, very in their face or very much more subtle. And I think that, you know, then it's an easy leap then to say that COVID was most likely, uh, you know, a death reminder, right? Yeah, I mean, this is something that has been manipulated by, and it's something you're probably not aware of as a, an American, but it, but as a European, certainly in the UK, this is, if, if you take any interest whatsoever in all of these beautiful old churches that we have up and down the country, um, especially medieval ones, this is very much in your face all of the time. There are skulls and skeletons, um, and often, um, and, and we would call them me memento mori, remember death. And it's a central theme theme throughout um, European Christianity. And, and quite literally, you will have skeletons or wall paintings or stained glass windows with the skeleton there and the words wow. underneath it in Latin. As I am now, so shall you be. I was once very fair, fairer than, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and these reliefs on the walls literally saying this. And, and, and so what it's trying to do um, is to try and induce that that fear of death uh, in order to achieve conformity to the religious group. Um, obviously, it worked very well. I mean, if, it, if it's been embedded over centuries, so right, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm 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 not for a moment suggesting that these various uh, vicars, bishops, and, and and so on kind of colluded together. I think they just struck upon something that was a formula that was successful and and repeated it again and again and again and again um and so it was very it was very interesting to see that that flare up um and i think that the religious the religious metaphor here is is is, is useful the christian metaphor as well because going back to the the, the, the twin ontological motives for a second in, in the article they talk about it the collective identity on the one hand and the self-distinction on the other. So within a, a religious context, um, you know, back in the, the, the Middle Ages, you know, the, most people would have agreed with the, the religious worldview, but by showing real zealotry, you could achieve, um, you know, more status by showing how, how much more committed you were to, to those values. And, and that's what these artistic reliefs attempted to, to, to get at. And it, it's almost like, that kind of magical spell, if you like, um, or, or psychological trick um, that I saw growing up in churches in in the UK was just cast this time through George Floyd, um, through the internet. And people really were trying to develop a sense of meaning for themselves. Um, yeah, carry on. No, I was just going to say, you know, is. It, it... Um, you know, I talked to many people about this and, and including you at, at different times, but, um, you know, our sense of time shifted when we were at home, you know, mm -hmm. things, 
things that used to be very urgent suddenly became not at all urgent. Other things that, you know, seemed, uh, you know, that, that, that just sort of seemed like white noise suddenly came, you know, uh, very much into the fore. And, um, you know, so, so we were just, you know, everything was shifting and we were just bombarded with, you know, how many people died, how many people were hospitalized, you know, um, over and over again. And, and I think that, um, the, un you know, the, the uncertainty, of maybe death was, um, exacerbated by the uncertainty of the length of say a lockdown or whatever. Um, you know, I often said I, I probably would have accomplished a ton more if they had said, okay, so you're going to be home for six weeks. And I'd been like, Ooh, six weeks. Okay. Let's make a plan. Right. But instead we were all like, Oh, you know, six days turned into six weeks, which turned into six months. And, um, and we all sort of like sat around and waited either for death or for the all clear. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, we just, I mean, there was, wasn't as much to do, uh, in many ways, but that extra time was sort of consumed by watching numbers or learning, you know, is, is, is today a good day? This week, a good week to go out grocery shopping or, you know, whatever, um, and instructions on what to do and what kind of mask and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I really think that, um, you know, again, uh, between, you know, being confronted with it. I, I mean, I think existentialism, right, uh, would argue that it's always there, right? That it's, that we are always aware of it, but that this was a little more in your face. Yeah, I mean, I think from an existential, from a, philo a philosophical, philosophical point of view, um, it wouldn't just be death. Um, it's not just death, it's the, the death brings about being confronted with death can bring about the, the existential crisis point, right? So what we're describing when we see all of this start to explode is a crisis point where people start to demand meaning. Um, but it's also the kind of quest for meaning in a world in which meaning is kind of evaporated. So, um, for example, Nietzsche famously said that God is dead and many people have a very superficial understanding of, of, of what that statement actually means. Um, for example, people thought that, well, oh, Nietzsche was saying God is dead. Nietzsche was highly critical of Christianity and therefore it was a celebration. Um, it, it, it quite the contrary, like God is dead was a lamentation. Um, it said that, you know, we had basically murdered God. We had murdered Christianity through our reason and our reason is not easily, it, it, he hoped it would do eventually, but it, it's not easily going to give us the kind of halfway decent meaning making significance making system that Christianity offered us. And so as a backdrop, so, so, so I mean, I think of COVID as kind of like the match that sets off the powder keg, the powder keg that's been building underneath it all. I and mean, McWalter talks about this, you know, when he talks about the, you know, the woke being the, the elect, these people who have managed to make their own meaning system, I would argue out of a kind of a, a bastardized version of Christianity. Um, uh, but, but COVID just set all of this off. It, it, it propelled this, this, this to the very forefront, but, but it's always been there. Um, I, I think that to give you another example because uh, somebody I think gets postmodernism entirely wrong, but makes some good points. Jordan Peterson. Um, Jordan Peterson, for example, uh, talks about Star Wars. You know, you're you're like a you're there with your, your Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris books, and you're oh, I'm an atheist. Like the guy I saw once on the beach in Japan, he was holding a can of beer with a black t-shirt on white impact capital letting lettering i'm an atheist debate me um but anyway that sort of person who on the one hand will claim to be an absolute atheist and not believe in god and perhaps they don't um but on the other is a a massive fan of star wars right you know is a huge fan of luke skywalker and may the force be with you and dreams about using the force and all that kind of stuff um so you can see how that that quest for meaning that found a much more powerful expression in, in religion is now channeled into critical social justice. And then it's already there. It's already at crisis point for lots of people. 
that's why lots of people, even before um, before COVID kicks off, are already tipping. You know, it's already becoming a very significant and dangerous cultural force. And then when the match keg just hits it off, when people are really now people who would be basically okay most of the time, now they're being pushed into existential crisis territory. Um, that's where they turn to. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what is, what is life's meaning then? Right. You know, if, uh, if not to, um, you know, to leave, you know, to, to leave a legacy and to have, you know, to have your, uh, your existence, your pain, your suffering to have meant something, right. Um, if you, you know, certainly you can understand, you know, if people, you know, George Floyd's family had lost a family member, right? And so his Absolutely. his life needs to mean something, and um, you know, and and I think that that's you know, it's very common for all of us. But certainly, when people lose their life in in a, in a violent way, that the the family, the loved ones, really need for that to have meant something. And I think um, you know that's true of you know, I mean, certainly could never equate it, but having been canceled, I want that to mean, to have meant something, right? I want, you know, you want your pain or your, you know, your loved one's pain, um, uh, maybe even their disease, maybe even our own disease to have, uh, you know, to, for us to have made a contribution in some way. And it's no accident, by the way, that, you know, despite Christianity having essentially, well, being dying out in the West, that the, the, sim the symbolism of Christianity nevertheless endures. And it's no accident, therefore, that we see these murals of George Floyd, um, right. in which he's being presented as a Christ-like figure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you'd have some people on the right saying, well, you know, he had quite a violent and criminal life, which is on the one hand true, but on the other, it doesn't really matter, right? It's not really about right. him anymore. Not It's not about George Floyd, who he was as an actual human being. It's about the, the symbolic sacrifice uh th that kind of archetypal meaning that's being pushed through and and, and he's the the counter if you like that that that's being used to to, to symbolize that and it's it's very 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 interesting how that's happening right he is not just one person anymore no he's an archetype yeah and, right. and his 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 life is essentially irrelevant and in that sense he has become a uh, another version of Christ, and, and if you want to go, um, when we really go down the rabbit hole, you could say that that um, Saul of Tarsus, Saint Paul, you know, the, the founder of Catholicism, and um, he basically took Mithras, which was an earlier kind of messi messianic figure, and he took his life and then superimposed that upon the life of Jesus, and so in, in many theologians would think that actually the when we talk about jesus we're not talking about the person who originally was considered to be christ or what their life was we're talking about a much kind of earlier set of meanings um that is then imposed upon that person and that they're, they're, who they were originally is kind of irrelevant and that seems to be it seems that that meaning is kind of forcing its way back like constantly back through this almost um like come on i'm, I'm gonna go really down the rabbit hole now but this almost kind of um jungian kind of um collective unconscious and I don't, I don't mean i actually believe in the collective unconscious but there is some kind of um shared evolutionary traits yeah. that seem to bring up these 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 jungian kind of figures i really don't want to go all kind of jordan peterson <laughs> here but there is something to that and it is interesting how these kind of figures re-emerge throughout history um who are symbolically the same and that seems to give people meaning it seems to give people a coping mechanism it seems yeah. that people can't really function without such a coping mechanism, perhaps. Yeah, in the article, they're talking about, you know, the, she says, you know, according to the existential point of view, personal identity concerns and group identity concerns are intertwined mm. um, to to gain a sense of symbolic or uh, immortality. Most effectively, individuals must per pursue the satisfaction of their need for dis for self-distinction within the context of their cultural meaning system. So once the, you know, once the cultural meaning system was defined and in, you know, in, in some ways defined by, um, you know, some of the, 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 um, it, you know, to my way of thinking, um, uh, 
people were offered sort of a way to um, to reconcile these twin ontological motives, mm-hmm. um, but they were offered away by people like Robin DiAngelo and um, Ibram X. Kendi. They, they were essentially given a recipe, right, yes, a recipe. for how to, for how to um, you know to reconcile these two things. You could um, you could become a you know no matter what group you were in, you could become a social justice warrior or a, um, you know, you could become one of the crying white women, uh, in, in Robin D'Angelo's book, or you could, you know, you could become an anti-racist. Um, so you could sort of join the group, um, the virtuous, the most virtuous group, um, you know, by sort of subscribing to some of these, they, they gave, they gave people a way to do it. And, and here's the key difference between Christianity, right? So Christianity, that kind of behavior is held in check by the concept of pride. Like, don't believe that, you know, try to be as Christ-like as you can, but you should also be modest. Don't believe that you, you know, don't believe that you can become Christ, right? Um, don't believe that you can build the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's pride. That's temptation. That's the way of the devil. And if you do that, all kinds of nasty things will happen. And, and, and you know, we can see that it's a fair point, actually. You look at the Soviet Union and what happened when they tried to do that and, you know, quickly went to hell. Um, you know, um, so so what was taken away? So the, 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 in many ways, we've got this kind of, as McWhorter would point out, it's, it's very similar from a kind of religious point of view. It seems very much like Christianity, except without pride as a check, right? Now it's like, go out into the streets and do this. You know, you, you can actually achieve this. This is, this is achievable. You can create this. You can make an actual difference. It's not about you being pious. It's about you actually enacting social change and, and activism. Um, and that was a key point. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, I just, again, I think that if there were any, um, you know, if people were torn between, you know, the, you know, the desire to be a hero and the desire to be part of a group, you know, these kinds of, uh, programs, groups, um, you know, really offered people a way, you know, to be both. And I think in some ways offered, um, maybe someone like me, a white woman, a unique opportunity to be a hero within the movement, right? Like, you know, um, to be someone who, um, you know, who, who gave up something, who engaged, you know, um, maybe engaged in some ways in risky behavior, um, maybe gave up an appointment. Uh, it's like, oh no, don't, don't pick me, pick, you know, someone, um, you know, pick, pick a minority because I know that, um, I, I'm good enough. I could get, get a job anywhere. You know, you should pick a minority. Um, and this weird kind of, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a new kind of racism, right? Like that's just, we're just flipping it now. Now I'm a, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, it's still racism, but they're offering it up as a way to be a a heroic form of, of racism. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's it's completely, it's, it's ridiculous as as an assertion, right? That, that, That black people are so disadvantaged that, you know, of course, racism is a huge problem. Nobody's saying that it isn't, but that right. should go without saying, right? Um, that they're so disadvantaged that they need us to, they need us, right? We have to right. step aside. We have to do certain things in order to benefit right. them because they can't do it for themselves. And that's right. implicit in the argument. And yes. it's not true. <laughs> right. like plenty of black people will be, have been perfectly successful, even in spite of racism that was far worse during their time than it is now. Of course, we want to get rid of it, but they don't need us, it, 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 you know, to sacrifice to... our yeah to yeah, no, in, and, on the, on their be and and again and to posture. You know, let's 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 be frank yes, because nobody's yes. going to sacrifice. It, you know, we're not talking about people who can't put food, are going to sacrifice sending their kids to school or anything like that. Right. To posture, somebody's making a calculated. Oh, okay, I've got enough money in the bank. I can make a symbolic posture. I might lose something. I might lose a few 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 dollars um, right. or pounds. Um, but in return, I will get so much social status and the social status is worth it. It's a valuable, right? So that's what they're thinking about. But I think there was like, so you've got that, the, 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 the social status and, 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 and I think by now we've 
reconciled the, the twin ontological, you know, the shared values and the desire to stand out and you have to balance the two. Like, you know, if I've got enough money, I can be more bold um, because I, you know, the, the risk of me losing money is less. So you know, that allows me, gives me greater potential to be a hero, if you like. Um, but so, so we've got the, the kind of the, the, the social calculus, right? That's going on there, calculating your own social status and your own risk. Then you've got the the theory that is being presented up by the likes of Kenny and D'Angelo, which kind of hinges upon standpoint epistemology, right? So how do I know this to be true? Well, my subjective tells me it's true, right? So it doesn't matter what your intentions are. What matters is how I feel. And mm -hmm. if you disagree with me, if you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that you felt that way, but I really didn't intend it. And it's unfair for you to, to, to make that judgment about me because I didn't. No, that's just another form of oppression, right? So you've got this absolute tyranny of the subjective. That's the kind of the theoretical lens. But then also, I think there's a third dimension that we haven't covered on, and that's the political direct dimension. Um, and that is the fact that there were no consequences or very little consequences for these people to behave in the way in which they did. Um, if we were to go 30 years ago to the same university and somebody was to make a vexatious complaint against you or to behave in the manner in which they did, just completely cold in that context, they would have been disciplined for that and quite rightly so. In fact, probably within the, the regulations of the university, that probably still is there. There probably is in regulations that these people should be disciplined and a procedure by which they could be. Um, but that was abandoned because the prevailing norms have shifted. Um, similarly, you know, up and down America. So, so, you know, there's no consequences, even if you don't anonymize yourself. If you anonymize yourself on Twitter, you can just create havoc and there's absolutely no chance of it and ever blowing back on you. Even if you don't anonymize yourself, you know, if anyone blows back on you, you say, that's how I felt and that's what all that matters. So the tyranny of the subjective. But then and even you worse. You can't argue against that. Well, you can because the answer is no, I didn't. Yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> and, that's, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't want you to feel like that, but if you're going to keep trying to bully with it, believe me, fuck off because I'm not having it. And, and, and that, I'm, I'm sorry, but fuck off is, appro is appropriate at, at yes. that point. Um, it's stupid, I'm not playing no, along. Yeah, yes. no, because it is. And you don't deserve a detailed argument because you're not going to have it anyway, so just fuck off. Um, but, but the third thing was also from a political point of view, and this was what was the most worrying thing of all. So, you know, we know about all of the various horrible things that happened on January the 6th and people quite rightfully being prosecuted for the stuff that they did, um, for the damage that they caused, um, and, you know, symbolic as well as actual. I mean, you're breaking into the, the halls of, uh, of power and that's dreadful. You, know, you have any respect for the Constitution and the United States of America or even the West, liberalism as a whole. That's not something you should be doing. And, and, and people were are, and are being prosecuted and, and, and good. However, um, there was widespread rioting all over, not just America. I mean, it happened in the UK too. And people were breaking lockdowns. You know, they weren't allowed to go outside, but suddenly the CDC said, well, okay, if you're protesting against racism, there's all kinds of excuses that are put in, you know, uh, that suddenly it's okay if you're doing it in that way. So that's kind of, you know, the penalty is removed, but then people are smashing things, looting, um, burning cars, stores, doing millions and millions and millions and millions of pounds of damage and maybe the worst riots in the history of the United States. I, 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 I would hazard, certainly in the 20th century. I, I... So uh, in, not in the 2016 article with about the heroism and activism, but in the 2021 Pruszynski article, they do mention specifically exactly what you're talking about, that, um, you know, individuals may have been putting themselves, you know, it, in this sort of heroic position where they were protesting, maybe uh, maybe putting themselves in danger because of the pandemic, um, as certainly at the time, um, you know, in close quarters, very, you know, congested areas, and maybe th considering themselves heroes by burning things or breaking windows or whatever in order to demonstrate just how serious uh, of a problem racial justice or racial injustice really was to them and how important they felt that it was. And so, 
yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this, uh, again, this, this willingness to put yourself in danger in order for, to, to demonstrate your heroism, um, and also be part of a group. I mean, what it, it means, you know, we could, um, again, go back to sort of group think and, uh, you know, and mob mentality and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, I think that that things politically, I think it's it's um, sort of frowned upon, right, to criticize uh, some of that behavior. Um, you know, we're certainly in, in the codes. You know, in the legal codes, they would certainly those would certainly be uh, some of them would be illegal behaviors, most most definitely. All right. So another thing that we need to link to is. Um, the sense of, of that collective action as a prerequisite requires this sense that political change is possible. Do you know what I mean? Um, so com compared to me, when I was 20, 21, 22, I was quite politically active, but the overwhelming majority of my peers were very, very apathetic. And university campuses in the UK, I'm not sure about the US, weren't very political places. You know, we'd look back to the stories of the 1960s and the protests that were going on there. And we kind of like wanted to go back to that time. That sounded like fun, you know, to actually have something to do. Whereas there were some of us that, that really did feel that way. Certainly I did in 2000 and 2001, that kind of time. But um, nobody was, or very few people were really up for it. And now suddenly, uh, and, and I think this begins even before COVID, right? Because the universities become these, these massive... Um, engines for change like they were in the 1960s suddenly that 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 just appears um, almost kind of ex nihilo almost out of nothing what do you think do you see any cause for that because I'm, I'm really missing something now yeah um you know i mean i mean well you're not you're not in the u.s uh, one of the things that that we've been talking about in with my you know uh people that uh maybe my former students who are trying to hire people, mm -hmm. um, you know, so now they're, you know, in their thirties and they're, you know, uh, connecting with me, um, my, you know, some other college professors and stuff. One of the things we're noticing is almost a flatness to, um, an, an affective, an emotional flatness to, uh, to many of our, our, our young people, um, uh, sort of a, uh, there's almost like a, a it's maybe exaggerating so almost like a zombie like quality you know that it's it's hard to get them excited about anything you don't see any enthusiasm there's no sort of brightness um uh in the you know in the classroom or in a job interview or whatever and i wonder if you know there was some maybe sort of um you know uh draw to that um, you know, there's there's a whole different idea of what it means to be connected now, um, what it means to um, to interact with one another, and this you know, and and this idea of what what's real and what's not real. So I, I noticed uh, notice a lot of you know, it seems like what's more real to many people is what they're posting than what they're what what they're experiencing in the moment so what they're what they're doing or experiencing in the moment is less has this less real quality somehow or less uh, is of less importance than something that uh that is that can be or is being posted and i wonder if there was a draw somehow in that way to feel part of a group in a way that is um you know sort of more universe immediately more universally communicated and, and easy to explain. You know, I was at a, a, a protest. I, you know, I, I participated in something. Maybe it's almost like a concert, right? Looking at a concert through the, the lens of a, of, a, a, a of a cell phone as opposed to, you know, sort of experiencing it. I wonder if there was, there's something going on there where there's a need to maybe to, to join something that everyone can understand more easily, more quickly. See, you know, I've noticed this kind of deadening of society as well amongst the young people. One of the, the classic ways I've noticed it is, um, and again, I, you know, this isn't empirical, this is anecdotal, so let's just drag right. this up. But, but, but look, yeah. 
that's the way every study starts, right? It starts off with an anecdotal discussion and which then turns into a, hypo a hypothesis. So, you know, we're not making a definite knowledge claim. It's just, you know, flagging up things that, that might be investigated because they might turn out to be true. Um, but, but I, one of the things that I noticed is that when I was, um, 2021 and I would go out drinking, most of the people would be round about my age. Then when I was 25, most of the people were round about my age. And now I'm 40 and there's hardly any young people in the same places that I used to go to when yeah. I was, uh, I, and it's, everybody's the same. There are one or two, sure. but then they just don't seem to be socializing in the same way right. that right. I did. And, and we had social media. I mean, we had MySpace and then we had Facebook. Um, so, I, you know, social media is, is an element here, but I don't, I don't think it's the whole thing. I, I don't know what's been happening. And again, this could be, I could be wrong because this, is just, this could be like some kind of subjective filter that I'm putting on things and, and, and misinterpreting, but, but I don't think I am. I, I think that, that just young people don't seem to be socializing as much. They don't seem to be drinking alcohol, which you, know, you might say is a good thing, but okay. um, they don't seem to be partying. Um, I, this can't be completely anecdotal because like in the UK, like loads of nightclubs have basically shut down. Um, well, like I said, my, my, um, you know, my former students are contacting me and asking me, you know, do you have anybody in your lab now? Because we can't hire anybody. We can't, we can't hire anybody that seems to want to, you know, sort of be part of a, a project or, you know, uh, uh, um, the future of this, um, you know, company or, or whatever, like, can you recommend anybody? So they're, they're anecdotally reporting it uh, also, you know, and, and they would be, you know, younger, they'd be like, you know, in their early thirties. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what's going on there, but there's def, I mean, yeah, I shouldn't say there's definitely something, but so you there's can say there's something... definitely in the kind of colloquial sense. You know? yeah, yeah, it's not an academic um, statement. You know, we're not going to put this in a paper yeah. or anything, but yeah. So I don't know how much to what extent that may have contributed to this sort of, um, you know, it, is there a lack of, of sort of meaning and a, a search more, you know, to circle back to to the article? Is there is this part of a, a search for? For meaning in people that are that are maybe more adrift now, are they getting less out of out of? I mean, I, I would think they would be getting less out of uh, 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 cyber, uh, you know, electronic kinds of relationships than they would get out of of close, um, you know, personal uh, in person relationships, um, you know. Uh, are they then searching for, you know, is there an existential sort of search for, uh, for more meaning? And, and do they think that they would find it in, in there? I don't know. I, I think that maybe this is a quick fix. And, and I think this is a problem yeah. that has been unfolding. I think that there, there are young people who do still go out in the way that we used to in our generations um, and don't have a problem. But, you know, certainly, yeah, I mean, I think there's a massive search for meaning. Um, and it's a huge problem because religion's gone and it's not, not realistic. Well, it's an option for some of them, but, but most of them probably not. Um, and so along come these mass political movements, um, such as in the wake of George Floyd, and it provides them that quick fix for meanings. It's not just, so, I mean, that's where I kind of want to link to the, you know, I kind of reemphasizing the same point here, but, but it, it's not just death. I don't think, I think death you know, again, it's the match that sets off the powder keg, but this powder keg has been brewing and brewing and brewing and brewing. And there, there is just, a, there seems to be a lack of meaning uh, among young people. And I think that's a, um, a serious problem. Um, okay. So let's move on to the concept of, um, in groups. What do we, what do we think about there? Is there any evidence, um, yeah. So, I mean, let's look at some of the claims that they make, um, for example. So one of the things that they seem to be rallying against, um, certainly it's, you've, you've alluded to it, you know, the white woman thing, whiteness. Is there really any evidence like to, to, that white people form immediate in groups with other white people because they're white? I mean, that seems like such a strange claim and yet it seems to be at the heart of this idea of whiteness. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know of any, 
Well, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that. I guess I do know of, of some, you know, they, they have studied, uh, for example, I say they because I don't know who, I don't, I don't know if these would be sociologists or educational uh, researchers or, or psychologists, but, you know, uh, if you go to a, a high school or middle school or elementary school cafeteria, you know, you, you will see that people are self-segregating, right? They're, and that's, that's not just white people, right? That's, you know, the kids are, are sort of organizing themselves by, um, you know, what they see as, you know, sort of their external uh, uh, signals of what would be their in-group. Um, and we talked, you know, when we talked about group think a little bit, we talked about minimal group paradigm and how really easy it is, um, how, you know, to, um, to prime, you know, uh, group belongingness and, uh, because we're somewhat desperate, uh, to be in a group at, at all times. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be that surprised, but I don't, uh, but I'm certainly not, uh, I would never suggest that it would be unique to white people by any means. In fact, maybe in places where there, where, you know, white people dominate, there would be less of that because, you know, we'd have to, uh, divide ourselves more, more, uh, more, uh, into smaller groups in order to, to, get, <laughs> to interact. There also seems to be something peculiarly American about this. Like, like my, my wife, for example, she told me that when she was at, um, school, high school, I think, in the United States, that groups would segregate according to race. Like mm -hmm. the black students would hang around with the black students. Um, the um, Asian students would hang around with the Asian students and so on. And there wasn't much mixing or dating between groups, which is really weird to an English point of view because it completely was not like that at all in the UK. The only time in which it became like that for me. So, I mean, like for me growing up, I had um, friends of Pakistani, Indian, Chinese, um, Afro-Caribbean friends in, in all of my social groups. And it was never, you know, I, I don't remember anybody segregating themselves on the basis of race. I wasn't to say it didn't happen, but certainly not in kind of middle class England where I grew up. It wasn't a thing for me. I didn't experience it. And it's and when I talked to my English friends of my generation, it wasn't anything that they experienced either. The only time I really experienced it was at university. Um but that was foreign students from different nationalities and they were breaking down because for ling what seemed to be linguistic reasons, mm -hmm. um, which is a little more understandable. Um, but even them then a lot of them integrated very well into native groups it, it, there seems to be this very kind of american thing in which people are segregating um and it seems as if kind of like critical social justice has found like a way to make something that would in previous generations have been undesirable and awkward it's now kind of being justified yeah well and uh well my, my university um they've proposed they want a safe space people want a safe space and uh, or students want a safe space and um, in a department meeting it was you know uh, brought up and somebody asked well you know what is a safe space you know um, you know I mean completely legitimately asked well what would this be um, and uh, one one faculty member said well it would be a place where you know students could go and just sort of hang out there's not really a, a hangout place, um, you know, on our side of campus. And there's not really a place where more than just a, a, a couple of, you know, maybe three or four students could sit around a table or anything in our sort of area of the building. They would have to go to um, and sort of go, go through our building and into another one. And so, um, and then another faculty member, um, a minority faculty member said, oh, no, no, that's not the state. That's not what the students want or need. They want, they need a place where um, uh, there will be no microaggressions. And so, uh, and they want to be safe from microaggressions. And so um, I, I don't know who was, it may have been me. I don't really know who said, it may have been more than one of us said, so wait a minute, not all students are going to be able to use this space. And the answer was no. Now that, as far as I know, that hasn't progressed any further, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think we're seeing this, right, is, is sort of like a day uh, maybe in Boston where only, um, you know, only black 
people go to the theater, for example. Um, you know, and so that these kinds of, you know, um, uh, voluntary uh, segregation, you know, where we want to have, we want to be segregated again now in, in, uh, but by our own definition, our own choice and, and our own, um, you know, decision making. And um, so I guess everybody wants power over, you know, those kinds of decisions. Um, but I just thought that was really, you know, I, I don't know where this is going, but it, it you know, alarm bells no kind good. of were going off. <laughs> no, yeah. I could. I mean, I mean yeah. the, the, the worrying thing is, like, is the terror that these students feeling real? And from our point of view, it's very tempting, certainly from my point of view, is very tempting to say, come on, get over yourselves, or, you know, what are you doing? But I think probably the terror is real. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily justified, but I think that the terror is real, that people really are feeling fear of the other. But the, instead of challenging that fear of the other, like we would with racism, where you would find somebody who was racist and they were racist because, let's say, they feared black people and you would try and rationalize with them and, and, and humanize and say, oh, okay, yeah, Perhaps you've had a bad experience with one black person who was a really unpleasant individual. They're out there. Same with white people. There are lots of unpleasant white people. But let's humanize black people. Let's introduce you to black people who are just like you, wonderful people. And that's the vast majority of black people. And that's that used to be the way of confronting racists. And that would how that would be how we got black people out of uh, neo Nazi. Sorry, that's how we get white people out of neo Nazi groups um, by by humanizing the other. Um, but the reason they went into those neo-Nazi groups in the first place was because they had fear, right? Or hatred, uh, even though mm -hmm. it was irrational. But now we seem to be rationalizing fear and hatred. We seem to be saying, well, okay, because you have had legitimately bad experiences with white people, perhaps. Um, and because they are legitimately, th th therefore your terror of all white people and your desire, not only your desire being justified to be away from all white people, but you, you're able to have a space, uh, not a private space, an, an ostensibly public space in which you're segregated. Uh, we're not helping anybody by doing that kind of thing. Quite the contrary. And that seems to be but so I, obvious. That... I do think, I do think though, again, in the spirit of the article, that that would be um, that the, maybe the faculty mentor, the students, who advocated for that space and the people who were using it would be considered sort of heroic activists, right? They got a space, uh, you know, they got the university to donate a space. They got this, you know, it's like, look, look, we, you know, we're, we are activists and we are, you know, um, we're, we are, uh, demonstrating our, maybe our vulnerability, which is risky, um, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. Yep. And we're, you know, we're, we're being heroes in this, uh, in this little space. Um, uh, and in a sense they but are. I agree. I don't think, I don't know that it's, that it's a healthy way forward um, in many ways. Um, at the same time, I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe that, maybe it is um, so, um, I don't know, disconcerting to be in a, in a integrated space. <laughs> Sometimes people need a break from that. I, I don't know. I, I, no, um, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that they, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that they do need a break from that. I'm, I'm suggesting that if you tell people like I, I, I've seen it, I, I, I've literally seen this happen. If you are a, in a position of power at a university and you manage to convince an impressionable young person that whiteness um or white supremacy in the sense that it's divine defining critical social justice um not which isn't the kkk it includes them or, or, or neo-nazis but the sense that white people like you know d'angelo would argue white people who are perfectly nice functional human beings who do not hate other people who do not consider themselves racists who are openly against hate groups like the kkk nevertheless manifest this in-group bias which at an unconscious yet highly consequential level um, is designed because that's what they seem to be claiming um, to exclude and disadvantage black people to advantage white people in a zero sum game. If that's what you're arguing, if you are telling impressionable young people that these are the forces that are arrayed against them, and, and, you know, this is coming from a highly intelligent and articulate person in a position of status and power. 
many people are going to go along. Most people are going to go along with that. Most young people are going to go along. And then you're going to back it up with, okay, not only that, you now also get social status by right. shouting, by behaving badly, um, by taking what would be perceived to be in the liberal sense dangerous actions we're actually going to reward you for that we're going to reward you as a hero you can see what they're doing right they're, they're, they're setting up like they're, they're setting up these kids to fail in one instance they're setting them up to go through extreme psychological discomfort and i've seen it i mean i've seen i i know of a a, a lecturer at, at a university that i may or may not have worked for um who <laughs> was perfectly lovely um and she went down the critical social justice rabbit hole and convinced herself of all of the above and quit because she believed she genuinely believed that she was being bombarded by unconscious racism. Right. That's actually what she, and she completely stressed herself out and the fear, the stress, the anxiety, all of that was real. She wasn't making it up. Right. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the, this terror management that these, these people are doing and setting up these spaces, does it, work does it manage their terror probably in is the, that in the, the way short, in which yeah go ahead in the short term in the short term it does right i right. mean that's the that's the thing is it's you know in sort of psychological terms it you know behaviorism terms it becomes a negatively reinforcing so when you take away something that is stressful um you know by by engaging in something you know, like by staying at home or by staying, you know, staying away from, say, if you have social anxiety, you stay away. Well, that becomes negatively reinforcing in that the the thing that was that was, um, you know, causing you stress is no longer there. Right. But the problem is it, it you know, it it, it keeps the, the, the system going, especially in terms of something like, you know, a socially anxiety. You know, people aren't getting practice, as you pointed out, they're not getting practice interacting with people. And so, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a self-reinforcing kind of system, right? It's, 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 yeah. I mean, to, to give you a, par a parallel from parenting, you know, going within the kind of behaviorist kind of Skinner kind of like paradigm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, you know, if I go with my six-year-old son, actually he wouldn't do this now because he's been reinforced out of this. But if I go with my two-year-old son now and we go to Toys R Us, Right. You've got all kinds of toys yes. and everything, you know, all these kinds of things that he's seen advertised on TV and it's, oh, it's a sword or it's a gun or it's a dinosaur, as he would say. Yes. Um, what he's going to do, well, there's at least a very good chance that he's going to point at one of those toys and he's going to scream and he's going to scream and he's going to scream mm -hmm. and he's going to cry. And it, you just have to go to a toy store. You can see this happening all of the time yes. until he gets what he wants. Right. right. So I have a choice. As a parent, what do I, the, the toy is actually fairly inexpensive. The screaming is causing me a lot of mental anxiety. Yes. So do I give him the toy? So what are the consequences if I give him the toy? Right. Well, as you know, the short term consequences, he'll shut up. He'll be quite happy. He might even say, I love you and give me lots of kisses and be genuinely yes. very grateful. However, I'm going to increase the likelihood that he will behave the same the next toy store oh, we go absolute. into. He will absolutely behave that way next time. Right. And the more and I do it. And not only that, not only that, but he will scream and cry for longer. Right. Right. Because, yeah. It worked the last time. So I, maybe I'm just not doing it right. I should do it louder. I should do it longer. It will leave, you know, maybe, maybe my dad doesn't understand yet. <laughs> and, and, and we don't even need to go into like behaviorism really to, to explain this. This is just something that's common sense. Everybody knows yes. this as a parent. We, we know hey, this there like... is no better psychologist than a two-year-old. They <laughs> are the best psychologists. We, as we get older, we get, we, we are worse psychologists, but the two-year-olds, they really have it down. Um, <laughs> You know, so yeah, they absolutely, um, they've got it. Um, but, so yeah, but, I, I do think, I mean, to, you know, to circle back around to the sort of the social, maybe the awkwardness or the, or the, the, you know, um, the sort of flatness or whatever. Um, you know, I, I do, I do just kind of wonder like, do that maybe it's the, the case that, that they're attribute that people attribute things to maybe a microaggression or or something. Um, maybe 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 all of us need it. Uh, uh, maybe all people you know of, of 
a certain age, maybe not you and me, but uh, need a safe, need safe spaces right now. Maybe they're, they're, uh, maybe they're, they're so ill equipped to uh, interact, you know, uh, in person with each other that, um, that they all need to sort of be put, they need to be put in sort of a 12 by 12 room with, with six people and said, okay, have at it. We're going to, I mean, I, I want to make it. Oh, you're right. I mean, maybe that's what they need. That's what they, they think that they need. And that is what they need in the sense that that safe space will give them the the sanctuary and the, the consequent feelings of safety that, that they desire. Um, however, by giving it to them, aren't we being bad parents? Aren't we letting them down? And and this is the sense that I think that, and this is why I think that the metaphor for the child works, because we all know we don't need to go into behaviorism. We all know just on a, an instinctive level that we don't spoil kids in that way because we're not helping them. You know, if I, if I give my two year old that present all of the time and I make him happy and I reinforce that negative behavior, the consequences for him as an adult are going to be quite severe, right? Like I need to go through the pain of not giving him the toy because I want to give him the toy. I want to make him happy. Like I love like giving my kids toys. It's a wonderful feeling. Um, but, but I know that I have to make that sacrifice myself. Um, and, not only not give him something that I want to give him because I want to make him happy, but also put him through pain because I know that that's the only way that I can make him into being a decent human being. And if I don't right. make that sacrifice, then the person who's going to suffer most of all is not me. It's him. Right. And especially um, at college what... where they're going right. to be gone in four years. We only have four years, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to sort of, get them to integrate with each other, you know, and, and work in groups and, and talk to each other and engage, um, you know, maybe in political activism, even on campus. Sure. Right? Um, and so, uh, so yeah. Um, but this is what we're doing to them. At the college, you know, we should be moving in that instead of creating these little pockets of isolation that we should be uh, encouraging the opposite, right? When you get these lecturers standing up and saying, oh, I'm being incredibly brave and we're giving these students safe spaces. It's like, no, you're not, you're spoiling them. And your actions, they'll love you right now and they'll feel grateful. And you don't have to deal with this five years down the line, right? Right. Uh, great for gone. you. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. And they'll still maybe think of you as wonderful when they're quitting their job because, you know, it's not the kind of safe space environment that you wanted to give them. But it's like, no, you're gaining social status at their expense. You're gaining, right. you know, social status, brownie points and feeling wonderful about yourself and feeling that you're some amazing, brave hero, heroic human being by caving into kids and they pay the price for it. They're the right. ones that they're, 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 they're the ones that will suffer more in the long term as a consequence, which right. is fairly disgusting behavior. But people just don't think these things through. I mean, you would have thought it, if you can get the the metaphor of spoiling a child, and you understand that you have to make your own kids suffer because you love them, then surely you should get that that would apply to young people at university. It should be obvious. But it's not because they're, they're not motivated to think about things in this way. They're, they're, right. It seems that their reason is only directed in order to show, you know, the, the twin ontological aims we were talking about earlier, right? N number one, that you, you're committed to the values that prevail within your context, but, but number two, that you're going above and beyond. Um, right. And that seems yeah. to be it. And, and damn the consequences. Damn, and, and this is the point. And, 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 and so these activist groups, the, the the activism, the stated aims of their active, activism are not congruous with the actual outcomes. Quite the contrary. Right. Yes. Yes. And it's as if the outcomes aren't even important. Really? Not really? No. No, absolutely. Um, it is a, it, it is much more about, uh, you know, I mean, we keep coming back to this, you know, sort of signaling how virtuous you are, right? Um, you know, and that, um, you know, that you're in the, in the, you're in the right group, um, uh, you know, on the side of, of on the right side uh, of things. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in this article, I sort of wanted to, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention um, uh, sort of why in, uh, why we join groups. Um, and, uh, you know, they, it gives us, it really gives us the reason, not just why we, um, yeah, here we go. So, um, 
so on page, uh, what page am I on? I'm on page 40. And um, so they, they outlined uh, the author, um, this is the heroism article. So, um, so she says, you know, collective action can help define and strengthen social identity. So that's one thing. Um, uh, membership in activist groups or participating in collective action on behalf uh, of a group, on behalf of a group, okay? Membership in an activist group, in activist groups or participating in collective action on behalf of a group um, satisfies important personal needs the need to belong. So, um, and then also, of course, we have the value expression. It helps divine, define one's sense of self. So what you're talking about is, you know, it has all three of those, right? Where, um, you know, we're defining and strengthening our social identity. Um, you're, you know, we're, we're satisfying our personal needs. And then we're also defining ourselves, you know, in terms of who we are when we, when we participate, what, when we join one of these groups, when we um, you know, uh, you know, maybe even um, engage in cancellation uh, or something. You know, we're we're you know sort of demonstrating how how heroic we are, um, and then we're saying to we're, we get to define ourselves as someone who is protecting uh, maybe another group, right? When in actual fact, we're doing the exact opposite, right? Okay. <laughs> so um, I know. So and, you know, um, uh, I do want to, you know, I mean, hero heroism is just defined, you know, uh, by each group, right? Um, but it, it does, it is very depressing when heroism is described, is, is defined as, you know, is sort of, stri you know, canceling somebody. That's, that, you know, being a, a movement is one thing. Right. Like this is, you know, engaging in a movement, um, you know, you know, fighting for maybe, so, you know, social justice or 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 whatever. Um, being in that group, which is what we're talking about, sort of like, you know, sort of catching the fever. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and wanting to be in a group and and maybe being a hero, but being a hero by persecuting an individual. Um, is that it's the, it's just got this ugliness. Right. That. Um, you know, but uh, I mean, I've, I've said this many times, you know, my, my students uh, asked a, a, you know, a few questions about a group, but we were attacked personally, right? And so there's just this, and this, this idea that, that being a hero means harming, a, 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 you know, a, an individual um, is just, it's, it's got this like twisted ugliness to it, uh, I think. Hasn't it always been such? I mean, maybe. <laughs> I mean, no, but heroes, I mean, how are heroes defined? Heroes are usually defined in conflict, right? Right, slaying the dragon or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, and Nietzsche talks about this as well. Um, I'm trying to find, here we go, here's a passage. And beware, this is from um, Nietzsche, Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, On the Way of the Creator is the name of the chapter. And beware of the good and the just. They like to crucify those who invent their own virtue for themselves. They hate the lonely one. Beware of also of holy simplicity. Everything that is not simple, it considers unholy, and it likes to play with fire, the stake. Yeah, so basically what Nietzsche is talking about is, you know, anything that doesn't fit within this narrow conceptualization of what is good and bad, which he would argue elsewhere is essentially arbitrary. Um, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be zeroed in on. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Terrifying. So it, wouldn't that be deontological? Okay, so <laughs> we're going to moral philosophy there. Um, <laughs> okay, so consequentialism. I mean, so if you're going to... All right, so here's the big contradiction with somebody like Kendi. So Kendi is on the surface a consequentialist, right? So he would say um, if there is... Uh, some kind of impact, you know, if there's a lack of parity between black people and white people in a given job, then the only explanation is racism because all human beings are evil. So the concept are equal. So if there is an, an imbalance, the con, you know, it must be that it's because of racism, right? Because those are what the consequences are. So you're only looking at the consequences and intentions don't matter. 
Um, right. That's what somebody like Candy would say. Um, a deontological point of view is different. So a deontological point of view would focus on, um, traditionally it would focus on certain inalienable rights and wrongs. Mm -hmm. um, so how can I explain this in an easy way? Okay. Imagine uh, you are in front of a, class, a lecture hall and a group of terrorists break in with okay. Kalashnikovs, right? And there's 10 terrorists. They've all got their guns aimed at you and they put a handgun into your hand and they say, you must kill one of these students. If you don't shoot one of these students dead, then we will massacre the whole room. See, now I would describe that as utilitarianism, the focus on the ends to justify the means. Yeah, so where the, the utilitarianism, that, it's, it's, would that it's, be like a category of, of consequentialism? Okay, yeah. Right, so, so um, a deontological point of view would be, well, it wouldn't necessarily be, I mean, this is kind of like, you know, I'm really simplifying simplifying a lot of philosophy here but basically one of the experiments i would i've run with students would be like here is the gun and i'd give them right. a, an right. alcohol spray can you pull the trigger right? right so you can save you know you can save all right. of these students lives but you have to kill this one person and if you don't kill this one person you and this one person will live but all of these students will die right so a consequentialist right. point of view would be okay well bang i'm just going to kill the student yes. in front of me Yes. Um, I don't want to do it. I, right. but, but, I but I'm going to, right. because the the consequences would be less bad, right? Yes. But then a deontological point of view would be like, yeah, but can you actually do the action of killing? It, you know, because there is something that's kind of hardwired into us that stop us doing that, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath. But you know, um, in psychology, this is the classic trolley problem. Yeah, right? this is so where you're getting it from, someone... from Immanuel Kant. Yeah, which is yeah, he was you have a to push somebody off the bridge in order to right. Save. But so, but in, so so in deontological, to... you would be actually sort of dis defining the good or bad act in terms of the the not just in terms of the rules, but also in terms of um, the rules of the moment, right? So there's the overarching rules and then also the rules of that, you know, of an the innate, situation. An innate, an innate sense of right and wrong, an innate sense of right and wrong that, that can't, so where you're getting the trolley problem from is Immanuel Kant, right? Who was a, right. the deonto de deontologist, really. Um, so in that sense, if you're the person that can't push the person off the bridge or you can't pull the trigger, that's a deontological point of view, right? It's that I can't, do this because it feels inherently it's wrong. wrong it's wrong can't, to kill someone even if i'm going to save more it's still so wrong for me to kill kant would say that this comes from god i think right. in an updated sense would say that it it's evolved right there are certain kinds of things that we feel that we can't do that may be to an extent socially constructed but a lot of it's not even socially constructed i think constructed i think it's, it, it's human beings have a natural aversion Toward, well, most human beings have a, a natural aversion towards killing other human beings most of the time, right? They, they just don't want to do it. So is cancellation essentially killing the one to save? Or is that the is that the explanation? I, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this would be something we really have to explore. You know what? This this is a really great question that we should probably get Spencer on for. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we're going to look at kind of cancellation from a deontological and a consequentialist yeah. point of view, because he really is big on moral philosophy um and 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 you know what is exactly going on there is it um you know it, it, is somebody thinking if i cancel this person i'm going to cause all kinds of stress in their lives but the consequences the ends justify the means um or or are they just focused on themselves and i'm i'm being a hero here um i would think it's the former hero. i i i would lean towards because i don't think i <laughs> I'm, I'm, and the more I think about it, the more I think it is the former. I think it's deontological. I think they believe that they are being the hero, that they are doing something good. And it's uh, uh, it's an in, innate impulse, a human impulse to be the, the, the hero, this kind of this push. Um, and they're not thinking about the consequences because they can't be. Because, I mean, you know, 
this goes back to the kind of the, the paradox of um, Ira Max Candy, right? So on the one hand, he's appealing to consequentialism, and yet the kind of activism that he supports has caused disproportionately negative effects to black people, the very people he's claiming to be intervening on behalf of. And so there, if we reapply that consequentialist paradigm onto him, then he is an anti-black racist, right? Going by his own standards, by his own rules. And I'm not saying that he is, I'm just saying that I don't think he is, right. I just think he's an idiot. But right. I, I, I really do think he's an idiot because going by his own standards, if we applied his own rules to him, that is what he is. Um, he's not terribly bright. He won't debate anybody. You know, somebody like McWhorter right. will point this out to him, but he won't talk. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's just an idiot. Um, but that's it. So, so, I mean, the, that's the whole point. You can't, I don't think you can be, you can be, you can be stupid. You could maybe be a stupid consequentialist. You could be like, okay, I'm doing this because I believe that the consequences will be positive, but I'm too stupid to actually check what the consequences are mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the consequences right now are so obvious like you know homicide rates violent crime rates um in the united states especially amongst black people are i think the highest they've been since the 1990s um against the backdrop of them steadily decreasing over over the past right. few years um and it's you know just shot up around all of this so, so from a consequentialist point of view you'd have to say look there's something up with this mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Ferguson effect. I mean, this is widely understood in criminology. I mean, I don't think there are any criminologists who would deny it, and certainly not the consensus would, would deny that the Ferguson effect is real and that this kind of, this activism is causing really, really, really bad outcomes for black people. So again, if you were a consequentialist, if you were a utilitarian consequentialist, it wouldn't really matter. You would be against this stuff. You would look at the consequences and the link between the actions that have caused it. But, um, but no, I, I think it's um, I, uh, the one consequentialist way you could get at kind of being a CSJ, a, a critical social justice advocate, is if you were a completely nefarious player, right? So let's say you're either a stupid consequentialist, that is like you think that the consequences will be better, but they're not, and you're too stupid to check, or you're a nefarious, you're a malevolent actor, in which case you know the consequences are bad for black people, and everybody, but black people in particular. And yet you do it anyway, because you accrue social status. So the consequences for you, your, the selfish consequences are good. So in that sense, it could be a consequentialist kind of way of looking at things. That did not get less depressing. No, no, it doesn't. Um... <laughs> I want to make sure that we address. So you said something sort of um, almost offhand to me a couple of weeks ago when we first decided to talk about this article and we met just for a few minutes. We didn't, we didn't record. We were just meeting for a few minutes. And you said what you said, the one thing you were really worried about was, does this article, um, does this model also describe what we're doing? What, yeah. uh, yeah. And so I, I want to, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that because my, my answer is, um, yes, it absolutely does. <laughs> and, uh, it, it does. And, and, uh, that's the, 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 the beautiful and terrifying thing, right. About, uh, about social psychology, about social psychological explanations for human behavior. Um, you know, the, is that, that we're all, uh, you know, we're all in the soup together, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, the principles don't only explain, you know, certain groups, they explain all groups to some, you know, degree or another. And so, and, and so we are engaging in this behavior. We are engaging in our own form of activism and we are trying to be heroes in, yep. in this, in our own activist group. One of the things that I would, um, that I, I hope that that we can aspire to and that we can um, sort of hold ourselves to and, and that other people should hold us to is that we won't engage in that um, in that singling out uh, of of sing of individuals and the persecution of individuals and that we will stay focused on um, uh, you know on you know the uh, 
you know, freedom of expression and liberal humanism and, and that kind of stuff and, and not, uh, not engage in sort of the name calling and singling out of individuals and persecution of, of individuals and that we will, uh, you know, stay focused on the cause. And I do think that, that, um, from that standpoint, maybe we can, uh, you know, we, we can, as, as you said, you know, with your, you know, your model of, of religion, you know, we cannot be too prideful. Right. And, um, yeah, we have and, to keep, and that's something we can learn from Christianity. Let's, let's understand that actually the model applies to us too, and we can be subverted by it. And right. we've seen this. We've already, yes. we can already see this in the anti-woke movement, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in the classic example, I, I've, I've probably done it on this podcast, is the, the drag queen story hour thing, right? You know, uh, so, like, here's what they do. So you find some genuinely creepy person who should not be allowed anywhere near kids, right? They're out there. And you look at that and you're like, holy fuck. And that's the create. Cre that, that's the correct reaction to have. Like, yeah, holy fuck, what the hell is going on here? Get that person away. Um, fine. Let's be more careful about who we allow to talk to children because somebody like that has slipped through the net. Also fine. But then what tends to happen, for example, in the anti-woke thing, because they want to create something to be a hero on behalf of, and they're going to weave their own narrative. And so they're then going to say they're going to live. And I don't think they realize they're doing this some of the time. I, I know people who do this who are decent people. And that's another thing, right? We all do it. Let's humanize these people. Like, right. you know, it's not, right. you know, uh, somebody we both know does this, actually. Um, anyway, uh, somebody I admire, you know, so assumption one, this awful person is doing some awful stuff around kids. Yeah. Assumption two that should not be allowed assumption three it's he slipped through the net but therefore let's do something about it Let, let's create some sort of rules or some sort of system that will prevent or at least decrease the likelihood of that event happening again again totally fine but then what they do is they make this big kind of non sequitur leap of faith and then conclude that therefore at least a very significant if not most if or not, all. <laughs> right. I mean, the, the impossible qual qualifier, right? All. Right? You, and as soon as somebody says all, they're almost always telling, talking, yeah, about, right? right? Um, so they don't, often they don't say all, but you, you, you can get that they're inferring all, that they're all doing that. When in actual fact, if you look at Drag Queen Story Hour, the vast majority of it's just like somebody, a bloke dressed Reading. like a pantomime dame. You know, in the UK, we've had this, some, some bloke with a couple of pillows down his top and speaking like this and you know and, and and these people have been and it's even slightly sexualized by the way um, but, but these people have been um entertaining children since the uh, in the uk traditionally since the early 19th century and I, I i think that's long enough for us to be reasonably certain that it doesn't have a massively nefarious impact upon children and that's what most of drag queen story hour seems to be the vast majority of which of, of what I can see, and it has no so sexual content at all. In fact, often it has less, you know, there's less of the kind of the boobs and all of that stuff than, than you would see in a pantomime. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, you, people are creating their own kind of devils, right? Their own kind of forces to fight against. And we, as people who are resisting the woke critical social justice movement, we're, we're every bit as susceptible to that as anybody right. else. Right. Perhaps even more so because that which we're going up against is so powerful at the moment um, that it's easy to see devils everywhere. Right. Right. You know, and, and as I've said before, certainly, you know, there are people who are really into critical social justice who are actually quite nice and don't behave in cancel culture, partake in cancel culture at right. all. Right. Um, and who would also identify some of the same problems about having safe spaces that we do, and they may disagree with us, but that, you know, they're not evil people. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got to be extremely, 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 extremely careful because that kind of problem is already rearing its ugly head. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. And I, I think the, the sort of isolationism and the self reinforcement, it's like, you know, you, I tell you, it's, you know, that, you, that your thinking is right. And you tell me my thinking is right. And then we don't get, um, you know, we, we start to engage in our own form of group think. So, um, so yeah, we need to guard against that and 
which is extremely difficult. There, 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 are certain, there are certain things you can do um, in order to avoid that. One of the things that I, I try my best to do, and I, I think I've been successful to an extent because sometimes people think I'm a woke plant, which is quite funny. <laughs> you think I've been planted by woke people and I'm, I'm undercover. Um, so that shows that people are suspicious of me because I've tried to steal man some of the kind of critical social justice right. ideas and a lot of postmodernism and critical theory. Because there is some good stuff that can, like, and not just some, there's a lot of good stuff that can be found in there, particularly in early critical theory and, and postmodernism, I think. Um, so yeah, do try and find the best in, in your opponent's arguments. And if you can't find anything good in there, then you probably don't understand the literature. Similarly, mm -hmm. if you're a critical social justice person, if you can't find anything bad about the wider critical social justice literature, then you don't understand it because some of the key thinkers disagree with each other. <laughs> um, so you're not really a thinker, you're just an activist. Um, the other thing you can do is is harking back to something we just spoke about earlier, which is focus on consequentialism. What are the consequences? You know, are the, you know, have you had any measurably good consequences of what you've done, um, or are you just causing mayhem? And if you can't, or just going or going along, right? Oh yeah, or just going along, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For you know, for either maybe not trying to be a hero, but just trying to get your, you know, your, your social identity through, through. Right. I mean, groups. cause the article talks about that as well, doesn't it? It says mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you can uh, achieve exceptional social status. Or it seems to imply you can achieve exceptional social status by going along with the values, but then overdoing the values. Right. Right. But that would also imply that you can get a reasonable amount of status just by going along. Right. And that's the vast right. majority of people, isn't it? Right. I don't think that's us though. I think we are trying to do well, the hero thing. Yeah, I, I think we are too. Um, <laughs> and and I think that uh, that it's good for us to to talk about that and to to be aware, um, you know, of, of the the pitfalls and the traps that we could, that we could fall into. And that's what makes us dangerous. So, listener, <laughs> beware. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that's a great note to end it on. Um, so we've taken a magical mystery tour through um, Nietzsche, existentialism, the management of terror, the, the crisis in meaning that has been accumulating ever since Christianity began to fizzle out, uh, how people have begun to deal with that, which is dive into new systems of meaning like, like critical social justice, which might have some positive elements, but was already becoming dangerous well before COVID happened and how COVID was the match that set that powder keg off and caused this explosion as people were, were staring death and crisis uh, really in the face. Um, hopefully it will improve some depressing um, conclusions about how Certain people who are gaining status within the university system, they're gaining status for being seen to be heroes, to do good, are actually doing harm, doing short term good, but long term harm to the very people they claim to be inter intervening on behalf of. And how in order to belong to a activist movement, to be seen as a hero within an activist movement, the actual consequences that you cause to the very people that you claim to be standing up for don't really matter. You know, you can do a lot of harm to those people and still get accepted and still be lionized as a hero. And unfortunately, that's what's happening. And finally, um, we could be doing that too. And we have to be very, 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 very careful that we don't fall into that trap. Because certainly there are lots of very intelligent, articulate and decent people on our side of the coin who are falling into that trap right now. Um, so take care. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much.